Hi, this is Dr. Thomas Armstrong, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to Introduction to Neurodiversity, a Strength-Based Approach to Special Education. This is going to be a 10-week course, and my hope is to begin each module with a PowerPoint presentation that discusses some of the themes, major themes that we're going to be exploring in the coming week. This is module one, the roots of the deficit-based paradigm in special education. To start off this lecture, I'd like to define what a paradigm is, since we'll be using that concept uh, throughout the course. The word paradigm was given uh, great importance in the discussion of the history of ideas with the publication of Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And I think the best way to explain a paradigm would be to give you an example of how scientific revolutions occur. To demonstrate the idea of paradigms as they apply to scientific revolutions, I'd like you to do a simple experiment. Take a pencil or something in your vicinity and something that you don't worry about breaking and hold it in your outstretched arm and let it go. And I'll be willing to bet that in every case that pencil or object fell to the ground. This is something that we can all observe um, regardless of wherever you come from, what your knowledge base is, everybody's going to see that object falling to the ground. The question is, why did the object fall to the ground? And that's where the idea of paradigms come in. Back in the ancient world, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, there was a paradigm of the universe that was hierarchical in nature. At the bottom of this pyramid were minerals and rocks. As you gradually ascended, you got into plants, animals, man, various forms of nobility. Then you started getting into angels and archangels and finally God. To go down was to head toward minerals and rocks. To go up was to head toward the celestial realms. And according to Aristotle, the reason an object would fall to the ground was because it wanted to return to its origin, more ground. In other words, it wanted to go down to assume its rightful place in the hierarchy of the great chain of being. For the same reason they believed that fire was very spiritual and it flamed upwards because it was heading up into the spiritual realms. This is a paradigm that existed through the ancient world in the Middle Ages and was still in force when something new happened. There was a paradigm change. A man named Isaac Newton decided that there was another way to approach the falling of an object. And there is, of course, that famous story about him sitting under a tree, an apple tree, and the apple fell on his head. And he came to the realization that the same force that dropped the apple on his head was a force that held the Earth in orbit around the sun. And he developed this theory of gravitation into a mathematical formula. Force is equal to a gravitational concept uh, gravitational uh, constant that was directly proportional to the uh, product of the two masses being looked at and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So this formula gave us a whole different way of looking at why an object falls to the ground or you know gravity holds heavenly bodies together. And this paradigm, the Newtonian paradigm, which he came up with in about 1687, continued to um, be the major paradigm for explaining uh, gravitation and why the object fall falls until something new happened. There was another paradigm shift. 
The Newtonian paradigm held sway for about 300 years until Albert Einstein in around 1915 came up with a whole new way of looking at gravitation. Einstein believed that space or space-time was curved and that gravity essentially represented distortions of curved time space. And in this way, he gave us a whole new approach to looking at why objects will fall to the ground. Kuhn's idea of paradigms related strictly to the structure of scientific revolutions. However, it was soon adopted by business, by psychology, and by education to indicate a kind of a whole world view of things. And that when a new way of thinking um, occurred, this was essentially a paradigm shift. And this is going to be central to our course because we're going to be talking about helping to assist a paradigm shift in special education. How we've gone along for so many years with a deficit oriented paradigm and how we're beginning to approach a strength based paradigm. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at some themes that relate to the deficit paradigm that has been a part of special education for over 100 years. Racism, eugenics, brain damage, testing deficits, demeaning terminology, and incarceration. And I want to say right up front that I'm not suggesting that the current state of special education includes these things but rather that they have their roots in these things, in history. So let's take a look at some of them. First of all, racism. In your readings, I've given you a, a brief uh, summary of the mismeasure of man from the Wikipedia. This is by Stephen Jay Gould, one of the great scientists of our age. He unfortunately passed away about 10 years ago. But his work was instrumental in helping us look at the roots of testing, uh, the roots of the concept of intelligence, and so forth. And one of the things that Dr. Gould suggested was that the measuring of intellect, the measuring of human capacity, actually goes back to the early part. Well, it goes back to the 19th century, as we'll see. But in particular, in the early part of the 20th century, it was immersed in racism. We had uh, people creating models uh, that were essentially similar to the great chain of being, where at the lower rungs you had minority groups, and at the upper rungs you had the, you know, the races that were in charge, the white race, essentially. And they the people who came up with this, these racist ideas uh, were very attached to the idea of craniology, uh, that you really could measure the intellect by noting the volume inside the brain. And Gould goes into this uh, a great deal in his book. And I've put the book on the recommended reading list uh, and encourage you to read it because it really gives us some interesting perspectives. Related to this theme of racism is the idea of eugenics. Races were considered to be, you know, along a chain of being, with some races being superior, i.e. white, and some being inferior, i.e. black, um, that we needed to do something about this practical, that was practical. And eugenics claimed to be the solution for helping us create a better race of people. This was the idea that we would try to stamp out the inferior races genetically and uh, preserve and even foster the development of a superior race. 
And you can look at this image, and it's really interesting if you look at the roots. The roots include statistics, politics, genealogy, biography, sociology, medicine, surgery, psychiatry. I mean, it seems like a holistic image. If you just look at the roots, it looks like a holistic philosophy um, of the 1970s or 80s. Um, but it's quite something different. And it was very popular in the United States in the 1920s, in the teens, 20s, and 30s. And of course, as you well know, the Nazis took it over in the 30s and 40s to the detriment, to the death of millions of people. In the United States, we didn't uh, do extermination of individuals who were considered inferior. Rather, we wanted to sterilize them. And sterilization was legal in terms of people who were considered um, inferior or considered mentally retarded or feeble-minded. And a Virginia law that included sterilization of these individuals was actually upheld by the Supreme Court back in the 1930s, or maybe it was the 20s, I forget. But at any rate, you can see, look at the title, decision held step toward a super race. This was in an American newspaper. So we've got to keep in mind some of these ugly origins of our concepts of human ability and human intelligence. Another theme that we're going to be exploring in the course of our um, study of neurodiversity is the idea of brain damage. And this goes back to the early 19th century when Franz Joseph Gall, a German scientist, came up with the idea of phrenology, which you may be familiar with. It's a way of telling a person's human potential by feeling the bumps in their head, where different areas represent different virtues, ideality, cautiousness, secretiveness. Oh, not all virtues, some vices, destructiveness. If you've got a little bump above your ear, um, boy, that could be a real negative uh, in terms of how people view you. And began to appear, Vought's practical character reader, where you see the difference in the physi physiognomy or the craniology. I mean, they're essentially connecting this to the craniology and the racial theories that we just discussed. And we see the distinction between a genuine husband and an unreliable husband. And it was all seen in the shape of their skulls and even in their faces. And, you know, I'd like to say that this is uh, gone by the way as, you know, a field of study, but even in the 1990s when I was teaching in Holland, uh, the person that brought me there was actually doing workshops on physiognomy and telling a person's character by examining their face. And I'm not sure about the bumps in their head, but uh, this sort of belief still lives on in different forms. But it took a different form in the 19th century, a more scientific uh, paradigm took over from Gall's phrenology. And this happened with, uh, probably started with Paul Broca, a French physician who had a patient um, named Tan, uh, who had aphasia, who had a severe language disability. In fact, he was named Tan because that's all he could say, Tan, 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 Tan. And he was able after the death of Tan to dissect his brain and he discovered anomalies or lesions actually in a certain area of the brain that's outlined here. And this area of the brain became known as Broca's area and was significantly related to language, particularly expressive language. Later on, another uh, physician, Hans Wernicke, found a different area of the brain, still in the left hemisphere, that was related to receptive language, to understanding language, and so forth. 
So we began to see the identification of specific brain damage and its relationship to cognitive functions, in this case, language. This slide shows a more sophisticated depiction of the pathways involved in language processing given to us by Norman Geschwind, uh, a neurologist who was actually one of Howard Gardner's teachers. And you can still see Wernicke's area and Broca's area, but there's also the motor cortex involved in the primary visual area. And in your readings, you have a history of dyslexia. And essentially, the journey through dyslexia has been very heavily influenced by this idea of brain damage originally. Um, and now it's tending to morph more towards brain dysfunction. And even hints are there of brain differences, which is a significant uh, movement toward a strength-based approach. Uh, I know a person uh, that I met at a conference in Mexico who's a Yale brain scientist who works with the concept of dyslexia in fMRIs and other brain scanning technologies. And in one of his latest, uh, we'll look at this a little bit later, but in one of his latest studies, he indicated that there were differences in the way in which dyslexics processed language as opposed to the, the, um, the typically developing person. And so there is progress going on and we'll look at that in more depth when we get to the module on dyslexia. Another theme I'd like to discuss relates to testing and the, the emergence of testing deficits as a way of determining who is normal, who is abnormal, who goes into special education, who stays in the regular classroom, and so forth. The beginning of the modern day testing industry probably goes back to Alfred Binet, who in 1905 was asked by the Paris school system to develop a way of determining who is going to be most at risk for failing in the schools. And out of his explorations, he developed the first IQ test, which was pretty much performance based. And it's important to emphasize that um, Binet did not develop the IQ score uh, out of these tests. That came with a gentleman named William Stern, a German psychologist. Then an American got involved, Louis Terman, who adapted Binet's test for American school children. And we're all familiar with the Stanford Binet test, which is the first uh, commercialized, uh, widely used uh, IQ test. Now it's been supplanted to some extent by the uh, Wexler, the WISC, and so forth. But essentially, uh, when it came to the United States, it took root. The reason, and part of the reason for that was during World War I, they had new army recruits uh, in America taking IQ tests. And so they amassed a whole stack of data that they could work with psychometrically. And this gave a lot more, uh, at least quantitative validation to the IQ, even though if one examines the IQ test and the conditions under which they were tested, there were many, many problems. Out of this accumulation of data came the testing artifact known as the bell curve where the average is in the middle of the curve. And at the ends, you've got the people who um, did really poorly or did really well. And this bell curve exists to this very day and still is used by most psychologists and therefore is still implemented in the schools. In fact, um, when we look at the issue of learning disabilities, uh, one of the criteria used for learning disabilities was seen as a discrepancy between an IQ score and a student's level of achievement. And uh, we've also, of course, used the IQ score uh, for labeling individuals with intellectual disabilities.
there was there were other assessments that followed the IQ test. Uh, Lewis, uh, excuse me, Edward Thorndike, an American psychologist, developed the first achievement tests, the standardized tests, which are used by school children all over the world now. I remember when I was in grade school, every so often we'd take the Iowa test of basic skills, and there were other similar achievement tests. And these tests are still used today, and kids are evaluated as either normal or abnormal or dyslexic or not dyslexic or um, intellectually disabled and so on, based in part on their achievement on these achievement tests. There are also diagnostic tests th that are used to determine if someone has language delays, language deficits, or um, specific learning disabilities. When I was in my master's degree, we learned how to give the Illinois test of psycholinguistic abilities, among many other diagnostic tests. And there are also uh, the use of rating scales has taken hold over the last 15 years uh, or 20 years with the advent of ADHD and how ADHD is assessed um, in part through teacher rating scales and uh, parents using these rating scales. So we see this history of use, the use of numbers to determine normality or abnormality, to determine deficits or strengths. Um, and I should mention that the tests are used as well to identify gifted and talented. Um, I'll have to share my ideas about gifted and talented later on in, the, in this course. But for now, uh, we can see in terms of special ed how numbers have been used, have been an important source of information for determining one's special education status. Along with the testing that's given comes what I would regard as, and I think anybody would regard as demeaning terminology. Uh, when we go back to the early part of the 20th century, I already mentioned the use of the term feeble-minded. And we see the um, eugenic creed up here in this headline, the feeble-minded breed feeble-minded, we pay the cost. And um, people, uh, let me just go on to the next slide. Um, people who took the early IQ tests in the, in the 20s and 30s were identified with specific diagnostic terms. And Henry Gar Goddard, for example, one of the early testing pioneers, invented the word moron to determine a person who uh, was mentally between the age of 10 and 12 as measured on an IQ test. If you did a little bit worse, you were a high grade imbecile, then a medium imbecile, then a low grade imbecile. And if you did really poorly, you were diagnosed as an idiot. It seems almost incredible that scientists use these terms to diagnose, you know, these were scientifically uh, oriented terms. Uh, that were based on quantitative information. So how could one disagree with them? And yet these terms now have become insults. And even today, with attention deficit disorder, we see the continuance of deficit language. Uh, in your handouts or your readings, there are there's an article on the development of the concept of ADHD over the years. And you'll read how it you know, originated as uh, post-encephalitis disorder, specifically related to an encephalitis epidemic, then later became minimal brain damage uh, as a result of the work of Strauss and uh, Werner, um, and then became minimal brain dysfunction. They called it dis minimal brain dysfunction because they were unable to find specific lesions or specific brain damage. Then it entered the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as, in 1968, 
as hyperkinetic reaction of childhood. And only until, and only in 1980 did it become ADD with or without hyperactivity, uh, without hyperactivity. And in 1987, it assumed its present form as ADHD. But I often point out to people when I talk about ADHD, which has been one of my interests over the last 30 years, that ADHD contains three negative terms. Attention is neutral. Deficit is obviously a deficit word. Hyperactivity, hyper, that's also a deficit word. Disorder, another negative. So there are three negatives in this term. And thus we can almost say that the deficit paradigm has grown stronger with the ADHD uh, diagnosis, um, especially compared to some of the other diversities that we'll be looking at. And then of course, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, has given us a whole rich um, terminology of psychiatric illnesses and disorders and dysfunctions that has increased over the years. You can see the earliest version of the DSM in the beige pamphlet at the bottom right. And then you see the DSM-2, the gray at the bottom left. And then starting with the green on the left, you see them going through different revisions. And what you'll probably notice is that it gets thicker and thicker and thicker with an adding on of more and more disabling, dysfunctional, disordering terms. And we'll talk uh, more about the impact of these negative labels on kids. Uh, hopefully you'll do some reflective writing on it in the module one, but we'll be looking at this throughout the course. Finally, I want to look at the idea of incarceration. I'd like to point you to a, we actually have readings, a reading that relates to the work of Michel Foucault, who is a French philosopher, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. And he wrote a book called Madness and Civilization. I'm not sure if I put it on the recommended reading list, but certainly that would be an important work for you if you wanted to go into more depth, where he suggested that people who were considered mad during the Middle Ages were allowed to coexist with the community, but that with the advent of the Enlightenment and rationality in the uh, 18th century, um, a whole new approach took, uh, took root. The idea of madness as abnormality that needed to be separated from the community and individuals needed to be put into um, these uh, urban uh, institutions that essentially dehumanized them. Um, as Foucault writes, he says, during the classical period, here he means the, not ancient Greece, he means the uh, enlightenment in the age of reason. Madness was shown, but on the other side of the bars. If present, it was at a distance under the eyes of a reason, a rationality that no longer felt any relation to it and that would not compromise itself by too close a resemblance. Madness had become a thing to look at, no longer a monster inside oneself, but an animal with strange mechanisms, a bestiality from which man had long since been suppressed. Very interesting way of looking at uh, madness at what I call, what the diversity I call social and emotional disorders. I sort of lump them all together, including schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, and so forth. But this, but this idea of incarceration of individuals who are abnormal still seems to be a theme uh, in special education. Um, as late as the 1970s, I remember when I was at University of Massachusetts getting my bachelor's degree, I spent some time volunteering at the Belchertown State School in Massachusetts. And the, the um, 
ki kids that were in there, and I'm talking about kids, you know, ages 8, 9, 10, 12, so forth, were in complete, they were in rooms that were completely bare. There was absolutely no stimulation for them. They just sat on the floor. And, you know, no wonder they created stimming and some finger games and so forth. That was their way of getting stimulation. And we took them for an hour a week down into a room that had lots of enrichment tools and toys and games. And that's all they got. And that was the 1970s. Uh, now, we've come a long way in terms of people with intellectual disabilities. But we still have this problem with the idea of exclusion or inclusion in special education. And there's still a lot of resistance to the idea of including kids with special needs in regular classrooms, particularly those with social and emotional disorders, but also those with ADHD and so forth. So this route of incarceration that goes back to the Enlightenment continues to dog us into the current era. So those are some of the themes that I wanted to explore in module one. And your readings will take you further into the, some of these ideas. And hopefully your writing reflections will uh, give me a sense that you're reflecting, you're thinking about, you're uh, musing about um, some of the ideas that I've talked about here, mixing it with your personal experiences, with um, maybe some quotes from the readings and so forth, um, to get a handle on how there really has been uh, a deficit orientation toward in special education that has certainly gotten better over the years, but still has its remnants uh, in many aspects of the world of special ed. In next week's lecture, we'll be looking at module two, the alternative paradigm to a deficit-based paradigm, in other words, a strength-based paradigm. And we'll be examining, we'll be taking essentially a survey of positive sources, uh, also hi historical sources, that can support a strength-based paradigm in special education. Remember, we're talking about effecting a paradigm shift. And I should put this at a personal level that I'm hoping that you uh, who are taking this course, you students who are taking this course, will become part of that paradigm change that brings us into a more fully strength-based paradigm uh, in the world of special education and in general education as well. So thanks for listening. My contact information is, uh, first my email is thomas at institute, the number four learning.com. My Twitter uh, handle is at Dr underscore Armstrong. And my website is www.institute, the number four learning.com. For further information, get my two books on neurodiversity. First of all, The Power of Neurodiversity, Unleashing the Advantages of Your Differently Wired Brain, and Neurodiversity in the Classroom, Strength-Based Strategies to Help Students with Special Needs Succeed in School and Life.